I obviously don't know everything or I'd be king of the world. But yesterday I decided that I know enough that it's time to make a report. Yesterday was my day off and I ate a hit of acid and went to the beach and I met this guy. I mean, he's a lawyer, he knows a few things, I'm sure, but he was so naive about so many things. You know, I just didn't have time to tell him, so I thought, well... I mean, one thing everybody ought to learn at a very early age, I think, is how to eat pussy. This goes for women, too, as far as, I mean, they ought to know how it should be done, so they can tell if it's been done right. So I think I'll get into that, I mean, right now, because, I mean, it's complex. It's a lot of background, and you have to know to be able to do it right. But I can get the basics across, you know, and we'll, we'll have that to work on, okay? So here's the way it is, right? One thing, I think I have, this is Masters and Johnson. Is, uh, one of the things that happens when women become sexually aroused, men too, is, I believe, is that uh, the size of the blood vessels in the pelvic region increase, they dilate, so that the volume of blood in that area is greatly increased. One of the things you got to think about is that uh, not only blood, really, I mean, you know, dilating the vessels and all that, but you have to get a person's consciousness tuned into uh, the pelvic region. Sex is so screwed up in everybody's heads that uh, there are a lot of distractions, you know. They're uh, thinking about what they heard here or there about the way it's supposed to be done. And they're worrying about body odors and this, that, and the other. I mean, you know, or maybe they just ate and they're having indigestion. There's so many things that can distract you, you know. And I mean, that doesn't even get into personalities at all. Like, naturally, if it's like a first date or, you know, even second or third date, if you never got it on before, people, they don't know you that well. They don't know uh, what you're thinking. Here you are, you're trying to get it on. And she's thinking about what you said about the uh, South African situation or uh, the United Way is a, uh, a way to, you know, do good in society, whatever, you know, I mean, she's analyzing the conversation you've had previously or whatever, trying to figure out how this is going to relate to the way you're going to feel about getting on top of her and all that stuff. So, uh, what I'm saying is there's a lot of distractions in thinking about all those things. If the woman is thinking about all those things, her consciousness is really a pretty far removed from the pelvic area. So, a mistake guys sometimes make is that they're so delicate in stimulating the uh, vulva. If you're too delicate about uh, touching, then it makes it easier for the lady's mind to wander. The more things that are happening in the pelvic region, right, the less attention she has to put elsewhere. And talking about attention, well, that's another story altogether, and maybe I'll get into that pretty soon. But So anyway, when it comes to hands, there's some things to think about. First of all, what the ball looks like. Sort of like, uh, well, look it up in the dictionary, you know, look at the picture, right? There's like two sets of lips, sort of like a mouth, vertical mouth, you know, with double set of lips. At the top corner, tucked in somewhere, it can be pretty hard to find sometimes, but we get into that, is the important part, the clitoris, right? And this is the equivalent to your penis, right? Now that's where all the action happens for you. And the same is true with women. That's the major point of stimulation is the clitoris. And in order to stimulate it, you gotta find it. One thing to keep in mind is that there's a great variation in the sensitivity of clitorati, <laughs> clitoris. Like, I've known women that you couldn't touch it directly. I mean, you get 
close and they get the shivers. I mean, you've got to be really circumspect. It's like, and there are guys the same way, you know, you just can't touch the end of it if it's too sensitive. And women, and women the same way, you just can't touch the end of it. It's too sensitive. In that case, you don't want to find it necessarily. <laughs> you want to fold the lips over it and give it a little uh, cushion so that the stimulation is not so direct, not so intense, right? That's one, that's one level. That's the ex one extreme level of sensitivity is the kind that you can just barely touch. Keep that in mind. There's some that are real sensitive. Okay, the other extreme are those that I swear almost takes a pair of pliers for them to feel anything because, you know, again, they're guys the same way. I don't know if it's the way the nerves are spread out or what, but there are just a lot of differences in sensitivity and like I say there are some women who go towards this I tell you an example there's this one lady and I tried you know less extreme measures with her for hours like and she loved it I mean it felt good and everything but it just wasn't good enough it just wasn't it wasn't she wasn't getting enough contact to really get her off you know so I've had some experience along that line, but not quite as tough as her, see, so, but I get down to this and exasperation. I'm applying a lot of pressure. One thing, your tongue is only so strong. There's only so much you can do with your tongue, and you can apply a lot more pressure with your lips if you back them up with your teeth. You know, you use the back of your hand or something, you can, you can see that. If you just try to stick your lips out and stimulate with your lips as if they were little fingers, like, there's a limit to how intense you can get with that. I mean, it's for some women, it's just defined. You don't need to get any more intense than that. But for a lot of, a lot more of them, it's just not enough. And what you have to do is instead of reaching out with your lips like little fingers, you got to draw them back against your. Okay, you got your lips up against your teeth, and then push them against the back of your hand and see how hard you can press. I mean, press as hard as you can, press until it hurts. Okay, for some women, that's like the minimum that it takes to get them on. I mean, I mean, that's not all you do. You don't just, uh, just press them up there and leave them. You, you got to, we'll get into what you do besides that in a minute, but I'm giving you an idea of the pressure. Okay, I'm with this one lady, and what is it is if you do that long enough your lips get kind of raw on the inside where they're up against your teeth and my lips were getting raw and so I says well let's just see what the max is so I have a beard and it feels pretty rough to me when I touch it with my hand but anyway I just kind of slipped my chin with my beard up against her clitoris and I started applying the pressure and moving my chin from side to side I mean I got hard I bore it down and the harder I got, I mean, the more she uh, enjoyed it and she reached down and grabbed my head and pulled it even harder, you know, and I mean, it was a good thing she helped because my neck was giving out at this point. But really, it only took a few seconds of that and she was off. I guess that's the most extreme pressure I've applied to anybody. And as long as we're talking about differences in sensitivity, because you might as well know what my level is, I mean, like, I know this one lady that she likes me to bite her nipples and I bite what I think is pretty hard and she says harder, harder and I bite harder, harder and to me it is something that if anybody did it to me it would hurt and so I don't feel comfortable doing that to somebody else, you know. But now you get into your S and M type people who, you know, I know and uh, oh yeah, that reminds me of a story too. Once upon a time. Well, this is all background now. I suppose you should know with what authority I speak, besides uh, whether or not what I say sounds rational or not. You might be interested in knowing how I consider myself to know anything at all as it is about eating pussy. Well, I don't have a degree in eating pussy. Nobody does. I don't know uh, anybody that gives out a degree in eating pussy. So uh, what I mainly have is experience. And of course, I can't give you all my experiences at once. So I'll just try to intersperse a few as I go along. And hopefully by the end of things, you'll have some idea whereof I speak. Well, talking about 
S and M and sensitivity. Oh yeah. I think what it is is some people's nerves are hooked up differently somehow. I mean, I don't know if it's in the brain or if it's in the skin, but like I said before, there's a lot of difference in sensitivity. And once upon a time, I put an ad in the Berkeley Barb. There used to be a paper called the Berkeley Barb. And people put personal ads in. And a lot of them were prostitution and that kind of come up. But, uh, you know, anybody could put one in, so I put one in, and um, oh, my qualifications, too. I, um, whether it's a blessing or a curse, I, I can't say, but, well, I, have, I guess, for the most part, it's been a blessing, but, I mean, a good thing. But I just happen to be one of those people that has this humongous dick. Well, so my Ber- my Berkeley Barb has it. Some of that effect, you know that. Uh, have you ever had a really big one? You want to give it a try? Call such and such, and I gave my phone number. People call me for days. One of the calls I got was from this couple. They were just in town temporarily, like tourists, you know. But they'd read the Berkeley Barb from out of state and fantasized about answering an ad and so they just happen to pick mine so I show up at this little place this house they were staying at and uh, we sit around and shoot this shit and then it's I mean uh, the people she was a little itty tiny thing I mean I thought this is I don't know this stage too small for me to fuck because uh, I've had a few problems but uh, her husband I mean he was a nice guy Oh, yeah, they were married, right? Yeah, I've had a lot of experience with couples. But anyway, he was a really nice guy, and a nice-looking guy in good shape in his 40s, you know? And I don't know, she was late 20s or something. Thin little thing. So uh, I don't forget who said what or anything, but we just started taking off our clothes. So he said something bad that was uncomfortable with him watching. And I said, no, not at all, you know? I mean, that's, some people are into that, right? So, I don't know. I think I gave the lady some head. She gave me some head, this, that, and the other thing. And we fucked for a while. And a few different positions. And it was fun. And her old man just mostly stood around and watched. And I don't remember. See, here's what happened. It's hard to separate. I, you know, I'm 37. I've forgotten a few things. But they call me back, see, like it was a two-night thing. I saw them one night, and like a couple of days later, they called me back just before they left town because they had thought of a few things that they wanted to do, you know, haven't gotten over. They'd never done anything like that before, see, and haven't gotten over the initial excitement and uh, nervousness, you know, anxiety. They had imagined what it might be like if they did it again. So I came back, and we did it again, and it was a lot more relaxed. I had seen before, I'd seen, I was on top of the lady and I saw a marijuana seed on the carpet. And I hadn't said anything at the time, but you know, I had a few fantasies myself and I had to say, I believe those people smoke pot. So when I went back, we got high together, you know, and we were like, more like friends. And it turned into more of a menage a trois. And it turns out this lady is gifted, like she can deep throw it and like, her old man, he was a good-sized fellow himself, you know. In fact, I think his dick was at least as long as mine. Mine was a little thicker. I guess it was a lot thicker in a way because she was impressed. That was one thing that you don't run across it all the time. Everybody's not like this. And, I mean, it sounds pretty uh, Freudian, you know. I mean, sort of an antiquated point of view. But one thing about a big dick, I mean, regardless of whether or not, you know, in the sex manual it's they pretty much peddle the point of view that the size of the penis doesn't make much difference as what you do with it, you know. And that's true to a point, but I mean, if in no other way than visually alone, a big dick is visually more impressive. I mean, it, it draws your attention more, if nothing else, you know. And in a sexual situation, is sort of, as far as visual stimulation goes, the bigger the better, in a way. I mean... As far as, 
talking about dicks. I mean, when you talk about the whole body, is you know, there's a point beyond which is only a limited appeal. But we'll get into that. But oh, so uh, so this lady couldn't get over how big it was. I mean, she would look at it and she would say, she said something about how great it must be to walk around in life with this big thing hanging out in front of you. And it, the Freudian part, you know, it was almost like a case of penis envy. I'm not saying that everybody does, but it's almost, it was as if, it made me think of it, because it was as if she wanted one, you know, and she sure as hell wanted it inside, which that's, not everybody does, which we'll get into that too. So anyway, as we were talking, it turns out that this lady is one of those people that her level of sensitivity is high. I mean, it takes a lot for her to feel anything. Some ladies you have to fuck kind of delicately, you know, you have to ease it in and ease it out. But with this lady, I mean, you could bounce up and down. I mean, you could slam it in like you were fucking a horse or something. You know, it's not that it was loose, it was tight. They talked about how they had gotten in trouble because she did, it was a low insensitivity. They'd gotten to the point where they'd caused physical damage before she would realize it and I guess the extreme of that I've heard of people who don't feel any pain at all you know and it's not like a person is psychologically sick and wants to be hurt necessarily it may just be that everybody doesn't have the same level of sensitivity as far as music or uh, taste or hearing you know and, and people don't all hear the same or you know some people have to wear glasses because their eyes don't work the same as everybody else's. And the same is true with the sense of touch. There's some people that just have really got their volume turned way down low. And I think maybe that's why a lot of people get into s and It's not necessarily, although it may be, but it's not necessarily that they like to be hurt and like to suck necessarily. It's just that it takes a lot to get through and sometimes you have to hit them with a stick, whereas somebody else you can touch them with a feather. So again, this idea of differences in sensitivity, it'll come up a lot because, like I say, eating pussy is a complex thing, and we've only just begun to talk about it. In fact, where I was, was talking about finding the clitoris, and I really only got as far as the case where you don't want to find it. Now, in the case where you do want to find it, how do you? Well... One thing, you know, that in a way is going to be a help, and in a way, for some guys, it's going to be an obstacle, is that really, the way to think about a clitoris is, it's just like an itty, 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 bitty dick. And like a lot of guys don't like to think about getting down and licking on a little itty, itty, itty dick, you know? <laughs> But if you can get over that, and maybe I can give you some pointers as we go along, but if you can get over that, it helps, I think, to think of it as a little dick, because maybe you can relate to it a little more and understand, you know, how something might feel to you and how something might feel to them. Well, one of the ways that a clitoris is like a little itty-itty big dick is that it has something like some of them. Now, some of them have something like a foreskin that kind of slides down over it and covers it up. And in some cases, just like with little guys, their foreskin is so tight that they can't get it back. With some women, the foreskin is really, the sheath or whatever, is really tight, so that the clitoris is most of the time is covered up. Sometimes because of that, that's one reason that it takes a lot of stimulation is that you're not stimulating the bare clitoris, you're stimulating the, the exterior. And it's almost like, you know, in my case anyway, it's like, it's as if somebody were trying to give me head and never touched the actual head of my dick, you know, and just played around with the shaft. I mean, you could do that for years, I think, and it would never get me off. And the same is true of a lot of women, I think. It's because it's covered up. You could, you could give them head for years and they would never feel it. But all you have to do sometimes is, with your hands, gently 
depending. I mean, sometimes when you know a person well, you know exactly how gently, but it's always a good idea to start off gentle and work up. And it doesn't even hurt. I've made the speech before sometimes that, honey, don't let me hurt you. I mean, I actually say it because, you know, some people are self-conscious and they don't, they're afraid to tell you when it hurts. And as a result, they're uh, agonized squirmings don't don't mean really that it's feeling good it means that you're just about to kill them but they're afraid to say so so sometimes it helps just to let them know that it won't hurt your feelings you know because we've heard about the fragile male ego right and they don't want to hurt your feelings but it helps for you to tell them you know honey you can tell me when i'm getting too rough with you so anyway, you start off gently and build up to it. And gently, you reach down with your fingers. You're in between the girl's legs now. Let's say, we'll talk about position later on. But for the basics, let's assume that the girl's on her back with her legs spread. And you're lying between her legs, you know, with your legs way down at the other end of the mattress. You got room in there on each side, you know, with the ball, but gently take the lips between your fingers, or sometimes, you know, you sort of, depends on how much lip you got to play with. Some girls have lips like, uh, I've seen lips maybe a couple of inches long, and then sometimes there's hardly nothing there. That's another variability thing. So depending on what you got to play with, you know, you can either grab a handful or you can just take a little wrinkle in it between your thumb and forefinger. Or sometimes, there's another technique, just use your thumb sort of on each side, spread, and pull toward the girl's head. That little bone in front of you, denim, if you sort of catch it at the point where it bends under and sort of pull sideways and toward her head at the same time. It's sort of like, as we used to say in the South, skinning it back. It's like pulling your foreskin back and exposes, exposes the, the clitoris. Now, in some cases, what you find when you expose the clitoris is a very tender one. Keep that in mind. But sometimes that's just what it takes to get to the point. Now, talking about the point, in some cases, that point is pretty vague. It's as if the clitoris itself might be the main focus, but like all the nerves around it sort of contribute. Getting back to the idea that the whole pelvic area participates, it's as if any stimulation in that area tends to heighten the sensitivity at the clitoris. It's almost as if, you know, you compared it to a tit, like the nipple on a tit is a clitoris. And the, you know, the main body of the tit is the whole pelvic area. If you put your hands around it and squeeze the whole thing toward the nipple, you know, increase the pressure at the nipple, if you think of it like that, get the idea that while the clitoris is the focus, that everything that goes on around it sort of contributes to the nerve pressure or whatever in that area. And in some cases, it's spread out more than in others. I mean, like some girls, if you were to touch them on the ass while you were eating their clitoris, they wouldn't even feel it, you know, but like I say, there's always variation. So once you got it pulled back, the question is, how sensitive is it? And then, is there anything around it that's sensitive, sort of like, should you focus your attentions entirely on the clitoris, or should you, you, know, you spread out more? And here's something sort of to keep in mind, is the rhythm of the whole thing. It's as if you're drawing all this energy to the pelvic region. And it's sort of the energy builds up over a period of time. In a way, at times, it ebbs and flows. Like it builds up to a point where maybe the girl feels close to climax and then for one reason or another she gets distracted or something and the energy flows and you have to build it back up again. And this is something that you have to sort of monitor as you're down there because it's like this. Say you're doing one particular kind of thing to the clitoris. Just say, for example, that you're taking your tongue and you're putting it right on the end of the clitoris or right, you know, applying the major pressure at the end and you're going circularly around and around it with your tongue. At the same time, you're applying pressure above and below it with your lips, okay? And that's a thing you can do. Now, 
if you do this for a long period of time, what happens is maybe at first it's really stimulating and exciting to the girl. The longer you do it, it's sort of like the nerves get satiated. They can respond and respond and respond to the same st stimulus, but after a while, they sort of become numb to it. And then you gotta give them a chance to recover. You gotta stimulate some other nerves for a while while they do recover. These times sort of correspond to the ebbs and flows of the energy in the area. Like say, you starting off with this one technique that I just described. At first you might feel the energy build and build and build, like the girl gets more and more excited. You get the feel of this as, the, as we go along. And then she'll slowly, slowly respond less and less, you know, move less or breathe less heavy or, or seem less interested, really. The energy at that point is sort of ebbing away. And so what you gotta do is you gotta give those nerves a chance to recover. And this is a chance, a time, to back off from the clitoris and sort of explore the surrounding regions. Keeping in mind that, you know, these are probably not necessarily major stimulus areas that will get the girl off, but it'll feel good, it'll keep her mind in the area, in the old pelvic region, and it'll give the main nerves a chance to get their tolerance up again. Okay, as the energy ebbs and flows too, here's another thing, that sometimes you can start off with a girl, and at the early part of the experience, she might be super sensitive and you can't apply very much pressure at all to the clitoris. But as she gets more and more excited and as things progress more and more, and as the nerves again get more and more satiated, it might be necessary to apply more and more pressure or else, you know, the energy will flow, you know, the energy will flow away again and you'll lose the buildup. It sort of works like a capacitor if you're into electronics, a thing that collects energy and up to a certain point and when it gets to a certain point it, it flashes over across this little uh, juncture and discharges and that's sort of like it is with an orgasm I sometimes think that one of the things that are sort of built into this computer that we have as a brain is that the nerves neurons in the brain there's some sort of innate pleasure and all feeling a charge at the same time and all transmitting a charge at the same time. It's as if ordinarily in the daily monitoring of incoming stimuli and so forth, the uh, neurons fire in sort of a random order. Their stimulation from their neighbors is, I don't know if you know how, how much you know about the brain, but uh, to give you just a quick description. A neuron is sort of like uh, the roots of a plant in a way. There's sort of like a central root and then they fan out in all directions. It's as if there were a bunch of plants going, growing close together so that the roots of each one touch the roots of a lot of other plants. And when one neuron fires, it's sort of like all the roots fire. Scientists, forgive me, this is rough. As they all fire, the result of any one stimulus, the question of where does it go and whether it results in an action or not, depends on how these plants relate to each other. It's as if, if two neighboring plants or, or neurons are stimulated at once, then the balance of the charge that they transmit will sort of be greater among their roots at where their roots are intertwined and the other plants whose roots are more intertwined in that particular area where those two plants that are stimulated come together other plants that are in that particular area will be stimulated more and as any one stimulus uh, filters through this network of, of roots what how it's recorded, where it's recorded, and how it results in action is dependent upon how the signal sort of flows through this network of roots, okay? As I say in day-to-day -day activity, they stimulate each other in a kind of a random way because you got things coming in your eyes, ears, nose, throat, skin, bowels, everything. They're taking care of heartbeat and everything, so the stimulation is kind of random. 
And I think, to digress a moment, I think one of the appeals of music, or anything with rhythm, that causes the neurons to stimulate each other in other than a random way so that instead of getting stimulation from here, yawn, and everywhere, they get it from several places at once. And then, you know, in music and rhythm, there's a pause between beats and that stimulation again. I think this thing of feeling simultaneous stimulation is one of the reasons that music innately appeals to the mechanism of the brain. I think that's one reason it has its appeal. Okay, an orgasm, it's sort of as if you start out with the level of intensity of the level of rhythmic stimulation, say, in your brain that your brain would get from music. I mean, you start out in those first few strokes of your tongue on the clitoris, you can think of as beats in music. And as those beats are rhythmic, they create rhythmic sensations both in the pelvic area and in the, and in the brain. And as more nerves in the pelvic area begin to get tuned in to this rhythm, and you can contribute to the rhythm and contribute to how many nerves in the area are feeling this rhythm with the hands, as I mentioned before. If you augment what you do with your lips with your hands, if you use your fingertips around the vulva in the same way that you're using your tongue on the clitoris, it has an additive effect. That gives you an idea, I mean, as far as the actual technique goes, I mean, we can get into that more later, but what happens is, as more and more cells get tuned into this rhythm, what an orgasm is, it's sort of like, in nuclear physics, it's sort of like critical mass. When you get enough electrons bombarding each other, you get a nuclear explosion. Well, in the brain, if you get enough neurons firing in rhythm, which you do in sex, you get something like a nuclear explosion. You get a, a greater reaction than just the sum of all the additive impulses coming in. The nerves get in sync with each other and get each other off, if you can imagine that. That pretty much covers the basics. I mean, that tells you how to get to it and something about what is happening and what you're trying to make happen as you get it off. One of the complexities is... In order to be good at eating pussy, you gotta do it. In order to do it, you gotta want to. The question is, why would you want to? And uh, I remember before I ever had, that sort of puzzled me in a way. And I was first introduced to the concept. I was working at this country club in Miami. That's where I first found out what rich people are like. These guys I work with, uh, they were into eating pussy, you know, and they'd been to these poor houses in Havana back in the uh, old Batista days. And they were telling me about, oh, you know, kind of conventional shit about pouring champagne in between their tits and letting it run down their belly and licking it off of their pussy and all this about eating pussy this and eating pussy that. And I says, hey, man, what is it? What does it taste like? Is it good? Is that why you do it? Does it taste good? Is that why you do it? He says, it's not so much the taste. It's just that it makes the woman feel so hot, you know. It makes her feel so hot. That's why you do it. So as to how it tastes and smells, it can taste good. I mean, I have tasted some pussy. i tell you how I like it. I like it clean, fresh out of the shower. And spread those lips, honey, and wash it out good. Because here's what it's like. You got this wet skin. You got this tube of wet skin and it stays wet all the time. And just like skin on any other part of your body, it grows and it peels. As it peels, you know, the upper layers shred off. They gotta go somewhere and what they do is they, you know, eventually work their way down the vagina and well, they accumulate inside the vagina too, you know, they can like crazy. The same with the vulva, you know, the same kind of a situation. And the same thing, fellas, with dick, especially if you aren't circumcised. You got the foreskin over the penis all the time, over the glands, if you wear it that way. And no matter how you wear it, almost, you wind up with a wrinkle here or there. You got moist skin against moist skin all the time, and no place for the old cells to go, but just build up right there. And in guys, we call it smegma. And I don't know if there's a different word for ladies, but they get it too. And so, smegma, 
I tell you, it smells something like toe jam. I mean, if you get a nice big chunk of it. <laughs> it's like if you go without washing your feet for a week or something, you know, and you dig out between your toes. I mean, it's the same kind of a situation. Maybe a little different bacteria growing here and there, but it can be rank. So uh, here's my philosophy. If you don't know the girl and if you don't know what kind of habit she's got. If she's beautiful and you want to make her feel good and you're not sure, you can sort of clean things up yourself in a way that will make it a lot more pleasant and inobtrusive, really. Even a girl who uh, lubricates a lot, and we'll get into that. The outside and up around the clitoris sometimes are still kind of dry, so nobody's going to be offended necessarily if you reach up with your fingers to your lip, you know, I mean, don't do it while you're kissing the girl necessarily, be discreet, but have some saliva in your mouth, put it on your fingers, put your fingers down and work them in between the lips. With your fingers, you can spread the lips apart and get down around the beside the clitoris and down around the lips of the edge of the vagina. You can use that saliva on your fingers to sort of mobilize any possible accumulated accretions, liquefying, sort of move them on lower down, you know, sort of stroke everything down at the bottom. And then when you get down there, you can have the place where your nose is kind of be pretty well cleaned off. Now, ladies, I don't mean any offense. I mean, because I know it's a long way from your own nose and it's hard to tell what it smells like. And because of upbringing, culture, and so forth, some people are a little more shy about manipulating themselves to the extent necessary to do a good job of cleaning it. I can understand that. You know, I'm not looking down on anybody. <laughs> I'm just telling the fellas how to cope with a common problem. I mean, you ladies might find the same thing. Like, if your fella has been out fishing for a couple of days or something, and he gets home and he wants you to go down and give him head my first thing, I mean, you might find a mess. I recommend the same kind of technique before you actually put your mouth on it, honey. Grab a handful of spit and rub it. Play with it and make it feel like you missed it and everything, but at the same time, you can clean it up pretty well <laughs> so that you don't have to be into anything too heavy to get into to getting down on it, you see. Well, having dealt with bad taste, let's talk about good taste for a second. Besides all those unfortunate dead skin cells floating around, there are other secretions in both the male and the female. Now, this is a funny thing about those secretions in the female. I mean, my experience is that a lot of times with ladies I've had a fairly lengthy relationship, the first few times we got it on, I mean, how it is and everything with new love, and that's a complex subject in itself, but for one reason or another, they uh, lubricated a lot more than, you know, as we got to be old friends and everything. It's like later on, I mean, I'm sure they wanted fuck. Lack of lubrication is not a lack of interest. I'm, you know, I'm fairly certain of that, and we'll get into why maybe later on. But the thing is, they just seem to lubricate a lot more. And when uh, love was new, it was probably a common thing. But anyway, this lubrication we're talking about, now that is, that stuff is not stuff that's been up there hanging around for days and days. That is a, uh, brand new product excreted from these little glands up inside there and the fellas have the same I don't know I've never gotten into the biology of it that heavy but let me say that it tastes the same this lubricating secretion and I do know this much about the biology of it is that they tell me in the books that the purpose of this secretion is to cleanse the vaginal canal of anything that might prove hostile to the sperm, them being somewhat delicate little fellows. And so this secretion, its biological function is to neutralize any acidity or whatever and kill off any little bacteria and so forth. And it itself is just about as clean and stuff as you can find anywhere in or on the human body because, I mean, that is its purpose, it's a cleansing agent, right? 
that might help your head a little bit. I mean, if you're wondering about what this stuff is that you're taking into your mouth, according to the biologists, it's clean stuff. And I mean, that goes, ladies, I mean, as far as the aesthetics of it, it's a fairly complex thing, but the ejaculate that us uh, <laughs> males are very blessed or cursed with, depending on your point of view, is also sterile and clean of stuff as you'll find anywhere around the human body, unless, of course, a person has some sort of disease, which, you know, you can never be sure of, but I mean, assuming everything's normal, then what you're taking into your mouth is not going to harm you in any way, and it's not like it's dirt or filth, necessarily. But, you know, like I say, eating pussy is a complex thing, or giving head to a guy is a complex thing. And where your head is, as far as these little secretions, I mean, that's as important a part of it as any technique you might have. Following a similar kind of an idea to his logical absurdity, I was chatting with a college friend of mine once years ago about the aesthetics of shit. I told him, well, listen, all the stuff I put in my mouth is clean, you know, I mean, or I wouldn't put it in my mouth, so I can't see how the shit coming out of me is going to be anything but clean. And he said, well, if you feel that way about it, lie down and let me shit on your chest. <laughs> and, you know, while it may be clean, it is kind of messy at the same time, and, you know, there are these little bacteria inside of you, and they do things to it and produce gases and stuff combined with if you eat garlic or asparagus or something like that that affects the flavor too and I mean <laughs> it's a little overwhelming but you know if you lead an active sex life <laughs> sooner or later somebody's going to have some kind of an accident you know it may be no more than a smudge on the sheets but if you're not prepared for it, it can react in kind of an extreme way and make people feel embarrassed and so it's kind of good if you have thought about it in your head to the point that you can well that's sort of like sin <laughs> From the point of view is then, like there's nothing good, there's nothing evil, everything just is. I mean, that's maybe an injustice to the complexities of sin, but that's a basic idea. And so, really, you know, I mean, it goes as far as it's, it's not limited to sin, the idea, and that is that anything that happens in the universe is part of this big plan or whatever, and nothing is inherently good or evil, this is part of the plan. That's a convenient philosophy if you have to deal with shit, you know, because <laughs> it allows you to think of it in terms that are, you know, to put it in terms that in some way deprive it of its psychological shock value. So you can be cool when these little mistakes happen. And talking about mistakes, you know, as we go along, I'm going to tell you some pretty wild stories because it may not be anything that you'll ever encounter, but... If you know it's out there, it affects your attitude. <laughs> attitude is everything, and eating pussy. And all your experiences contribute one way or another. And your vicarious experiences, the ones that I have that you haven't had, those will affect your attitudes in some way and make you maybe a little better practitioner kind of things.